The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, the landowner saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you too go into my vineyard, and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, the landowner found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last ones worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, here I am, so you know something's up, right? But it is our Commitment Sunday, but before we move along to that, let's consider the gospel for a moment. In our first passage from Isaiah, God speaks to the great prophet and he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts, my ways are above them. And how true that is. And in a way, thankfully, that is for sure. If we think then of our gospel passage, the parable sort of causes us some anxiousness, some upset. Because after all, if any of us here started work at dawn and worked for 12 hours, and then when it came time to be paid, and the guy who started one hour before closing time, quitting time, and we all received the same daily wage, wouldn't you be upset? I would. And deep down inside, we think, that's not fair. Something's wrong with this. Moreover, my little accounting side says, what a dope. The landowner pays a whole day's wage to some guy who only worked one hour. Makes no sense. But the point of the parable is to shock us. The Lord wants to shock us into changing how we think about things. So consider the time of Jesus. In the area of Galilee, there were many farmers. Sadly, many of those little farmers lost their land because they couldn't pay Herod's taxes. And so you had these big, huge farms. So here we had all these unemployed people who just hoped that someone would hire them for the day to make that daily wage so that they could eat, just to eat, just to survive for one day. Without that daily wage, they probably went to bed hungry. 
Maybe their families went to bed hungry. So here, this very generous landowner doesn't have to, but he sacrificially gives to help these laborers have what sustains them each day. Here's a generosity that is beyond us. But thank God, there is such generosity. Then, we have to look at it in a very spiritual sense. In the spiritual sense, thank God, he doesn't hold us to a strict accounting of our lives. Here, many of us are what we could call the cradle Catholics. We've been here all our life. We've been to church. Now, if we're honest, we'd have to say sometimes we were more faithful and dedicated than other times. Maybe some of us would have to admit we went astray for several years, but we're back. Some may have to say, well, you know, there was that time when I committed some really bad sins, but I'm back. Some of us would say, well, I wasn't raised anything, but when I was an adult, I came to the faith and I was baptized. Nevertheless, whatever the story is, all of us right here and now have the hope of heaven because God is so generously gracious with his love and mercy. We have the hope of heaven. What's most important is the love we live with the Lord now and how we live that love for the rest of our lives. Without such hope in God's mercy that's beyond our human calculations, saints like St. Mary Magdalene, St. Augustine, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Ignatius Loyola probably wouldn't be in heaven right now if God were so strict in justice. No, God is so generous in his love. But that moves us to what the reason is that I'm here, and that is it's Commitment Sunday. So this is a time where, since the beginning of our parish, we take the time to commit ourselves to the Lord in service of him as well as our parish. You may recall that back at Easter time, we handed out these books, The Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic, written by Matthew Kelly. I hope you had the time to read it. It's an easy read, it's a good read. If you don't have one or if you've misplaced it, they're still available in our gift shop. But Matthew Kelly did this huge survey throughout the country and he came to the conclusion that a dynamic Catholic has four qualities. And one is a dedication to prayer, a dedication to study, to generosity, and then lastly to evangelization. So let's think of those four points as we consider our parish commitment Sunday. First of all, are you willing to commit 15 minutes a day to prayer? 15 good minutes. Now granted, when we think of prayer, we probably have our little morning prayer, bedtime prayer, grace at meals, during the day little prayers and so on like, dear Lord save me from this traffic, whatever it may be, right? But do we take 15 minutes for good prayer. That could be saying the rosary or other formal prayers. It could be reading a passage of scripture. Maybe it's using the little booklet, the Magnificat, to help us have a good structured prayer life, whatever it may be. Of course, part of that time should always be letting our heart speak to our Lord. So praying for our loved ones, thanking our Lord for our blessings, asking help in our vocation, whatever that may be, asking for help in whatever day-to-day -day problems that we have. But prayer, 15 minutes. Now when we consider that Almighty God gives us 1,440 minutes a day, 15 minutes isn't much. But that's what it takes to really have this idea of being a dynamic Catholic. The beauty is we have a presence of the Lord in our lives. We grow in a friendship. We know that he is with us. But let's consider, too, bumping it up a little bit. What about committing yourself to coming here to daily mass once a week? Or on Thursdays when we have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, doing your prayer time here before our Lord? Or coming to the holy hour Thursday evening when we have Vespers and opportunity for confessions. 
bump it up a little bit. If we make that sacrifice of our precious time, no matter how busy we may be, guaranteed the Lord will generously reward us. We'll have the time to get things done. More importantly, we'll know his presence in our lives. Secondly then, study. Will you commit to studying 15 minutes a day? Too often times we forget about that. It's like we reach eighth grade after confirmation, goodbye study. We have to keep on fueling that furnace of faith in our soul. So we need to study. For instance, if you really committed to reading one chapter of the New Testament, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew, just one chapter a day, you'd cover the whole thing in less than a year. Or take two, chap two pages of the Catechism, you'd cover it in the whole year. Now, granted, we don't want to just read it, we want to take time to think about it, but that could be done in 15 minutes. But let's bump it up a little bit. Why not come to the Wednesday evening Bible study with Father Sly that begins this Wednesday again? Bring a friend. Or maybe come to the inquiry class. It starts this Thursday. So maybe it's having a refresher of the faith if you're an adult, or some of you here may not be Catholic, but you're with your families, and you've come every Sunday, why not come to the inquiry class and just let God's grace work in you? Or maybe it's bring a friend that you know who might be interested in being a Catholic. Another way would be to come to the monthly men's conference, first Saturday of the month, or for you ladies, we have the Endow program starting. Details are in the bulletin, but that focuses on women's spirituality. If you're a young person, why not come to Father Shear's youth group on Tuesday evenings? It is sheerly fascinating, without question. Yeah, you got it, all right. Now, but the key is that give some time to your parish as far as study. It benefits you. We grow in that relationship with the Lord. But given that dedication to prayer and to study, so 30 minutes out of 1,440 a day, move on to the next. Matthew Kelly says, the people that have that foundation then are very generous in their time, talent, and treasure. Now interestingly, he saw that in parishes nationwide, 7% of the registered parishioners give 80% of the volunteer hours to the parish. That's incredible. 7% give 80% of the volunteer hours. So I ask you, what are you willing to commit to to serve your parish? After all, this doesn't just happen. We need altar servers, lectors, people in the choir, ushers. We need people, for instance, this Sunday, who are going to help with the pancakes and the gift shop rummage sale and the blood drive two weeks ago, the donuts and so on. None of that just happens. It comes from the gracious generosity of people who sacrifice to make this parish alive. Not just a sacramental factory, but truly alive. A challenge to young people. You may notice that we do have some young people, teenagers, who are ushers, who sing with the choirs, who are lectors, consider participating. You're welcome to do so. How wonderful it is to see our young people involved. But then we take it one step further. What about that generosity as far as treasure? Again, Matthew Kelly looked at the statistics and pretty much the same group of people, but about 7% of the parish contributes 80% of the financial funds to a parish. Now ours is a little bit different. Being a new parish, I would say one-third of our parishioners contribute two-thirds of the revenue. About 20% of the registered parishioners we have no record of. But nevertheless, we need to ask ourselves, what do I give back to God in a sacrificial way? Now, in the bulletin today, you'll see our printed financial statement for the last fiscal year. You'll see we are a very frugal, thrifty kind of parish. One good highlight is that we've finished one loan with the diocese. It's gone. We still have our capital one loan to pay off. 
But consider this, that because of the generosity of 600 families back in 2001, primarily, we raised the money and borrowed the money to have what we have, church, parish hall, offices, meeting rooms, school with a gym. We have what St. Veronica's wishes they had. We have what St. John's in Leesburg, St. Teresa's waited over 20 years for. Why? Because of the generosity. But now we still have to pay the mortgage. So I just ask you, what do you give? Is it really sacrificial? In my life, growing up, I was always taught the idea of tithing, meaning 10% is given to God. And my parents thought, well, if you give back to God, God will always provide. Just like if you take time for prayer and study, God will give you the time you need to get everything else done. If you give back to God with your material treasures, God will give you what you need. Pause and think of that. But I'll give you an example. Just two weeks ago, Truett Cathy, who founded Chick-fil-A, died at the age of 93. And the Wall Street Journal had a very nice article about him, about this man who finished high school, didn't go to college, but started his first little restaurant in Atlanta back in the 1940s. And from there, he built Chick-fil-A. But here's a man who gave 10% of his income to charity, including his church, taught Sunday school for 50 years in his Baptist church. Imagine that. You're the CEO of a company, and you're teaching Sunday school for 50 years. He set up a scholarship fund for his teenage workers so that they could go to college. He set up three foundations for orphanages, foster care homes. In he closed his stores on Sunday when he could have been doing business because that was God's day and that was a day for his workers to relax. There's a man who is like the landowner in the parable who knew God was so generous to him and he could be so generous to our Lord by serving others. Something to truly consider in our own lives. And then lastly, we need to also evangelize. Consider, will you commit to speaking positively about your faith, about your church? We always hear about the complainers, you know, the negative people, the malcontents. But what about talking positively about your faith, inviting others to come, asking others if they're interested in the inquiry class? What about ask, answering the questions that may come up at work? and being prepared. You know what the questions are. What about defending your faith? You know what the issues are, but in all, trying to bring Christ to others. So my brothers and sisters, with that, if you would take a moment and pass down from the ends of the pew these yellow sheets, and you'll notice they're perforated. But it's Commitment Sunday, so we're going to do some little evangelizing right here and now. The top part's for you, the bottom part's for me. Notice it's perforated. So the top part is what you are spiritually going to commit to. So what are you going to do to pray and to learn about the faith for this coming year? The bottom part, how will you serve your parish? What will you contribute of your treasure to the parish? So the top part goes to you. The bottom part comes back. If you do sign up for like an interest in Knights of Columbus, whatever, we'll get in contact with you. But the key is, what are you willing to commit to for Christ with all that he's given to you? With all the generosity the Lord has given, how generous will you in return be to him? In all, St. Paul said in our second passage to Philippians, as he was waiting in prison in Rome to face trial, for me, life is Christ. Whether I live or I die, life is Christ. And that's what it's all about. Life is Christ. May God bless you.